evidence of increasing in numbers of cases that has occurred outside of China. These developments in terms of the evolution of the outbreak is of great concern. There are now 6,065 confirmed cases, including 5,997 in China. Information is being updated and changing by the hour. It is clearly still centered in China, with the overwhelming majority of cases still being reported from China. So by late January, we had uh, you know, identified uh, several cases of COVID-19 in Singapore. They were mostly travellers from Wuhan City in China, and it was relatively easy for us to keep tabs on travellers from Wuhan City who had developed symptoms such as fever or pneumonia. We've seen our first Singaporean case here as well, which is uh, slightly worrying because it is the first local case. But to be fair, she also went to Wuhan on holiday, so there isn't community spread here per se. The few cases from China were imported into Singapore, and so we managed to keep um, cases in Singapore at a very low level, January going into February. So by late January, reports were coming out of China that the disease had spread beyond Wuhan city to other major cities in China. There is a growing possibility that more individuals from other parts of China may be infected with the virus. All new visitors with recent travel history to mainland China within the last 14 days will not be allowed to enter into Singapore or to transit through Singapore. As we have said repeatedly, there is no community spread of the virus within Singapore. I recall it was early February. We found out that there were three churchgoers that were infected with COVID-19 at the live church admissions. When we first heard of it, we were actually uh, alarmed because you know, suddenly we have a number of cases that all have links to a church. So this was quite concerning for us because it occurred in a setting where there was a lot of mixing. And these first three cases were locals who were living in Singapore and they had no recent travel history to China. And we were quite perplexed and also concerned because there was no um, source for this disease to have spread into the church. So we knew that something could be ongoing. Every single case has the potential to expose and to spread disease to many people. A rising number of cases could quickly increase exponentially and go out of control. And we had to do our utmost to keep that spread in check. When we first identified the three individuals, we were concerned as to where they could have gotten infection from. It was likely because they were at the same time, at the same place, in church on the same day. There was some form of um, transmission in the church. So we interviewed the cases and we tried to establish linkages. When we have a case of COVID-19, Essentially, what we have to do is to find out when the person's symptoms occurred and also where the person has been to. This process is what we call locally activity mapping, where we actually map the person's activities across time. We were very concerned whether there will be more cases in the church. So we actually had to zoom in on various church services that the cases attended. 
any particular events that could have led to the spread. Did they attend any gatherings? Did they also go out for any Bible session, prayer session? So we're looking for all possible kind of interactions. Through the contact tracing and activity maps, we found that they all attended the live church admissions on a particular day, uh, which was the 19th of uh, January during a church service. If there was a cluster, other people could have been exposed and infected as well. So we actually went to ask the church pastor whether they have a list of the church attendees on 19th January. We were concerned when there is a cluster in an environment where there's a lot of mixing of individuals with a lot of close contact, it could result in more transmission and more cases. And our main concern was how far did it had it spread? Because by the time we detected and identified it, it was almost two weeks after the potential spread had occurred on 19th of January. And much of our efforts then were to do a surveillance of the church to find out if anyone else had symptoms and to send them for testing to ensure that no one else in the church was infected with COVID-19. So we have a list of contacts who will need to actually call one by one to determine if they were feeling well. If not feeling well, we have to then refer them to hospital immediately. If not, then we have to place them on a the phone surveillance or on a quarantine. Typically, they will have a lot of questions, as you can imagine. So it takes um, quite a lot of effort to go through the entire contact list. And also, we look through the activity maps of each of the cases to identify the close contact of cases out of the church. Until the point when the person is isolated in the hospital, that period is the period where that case could potentially expose to individuals who have been in contact with that person. I will actually call up close contact of cases to establish and verify their interactions. So that's the forward tracing process to determine all the individuals that might be in contact with that person. We also do backward tracing and backward tracing to determine where did this transmission originate from? When you have a few cases where you have no idea where these cases come from, they, are, they do not have a specific source, then you have a widespread uh, transmission. The first three cases were um, local, so living in Singapore, which was why we had to establish the source of infection of that cluster. Because when we are unable to identify these individuals, they might spread disease without us knowing. So it is quite a challenge, both in terms of time and resources. And that's why it's not only the contact traces that are in this. We work very closely with uh, the police, um, the investigators, because their core business is trying to find out information from people. I work as an analyst in the Singapore Police Force. I was involved uh, right at the onset of this probe into the church cluster. My focus uh, is to do backward tracing. Basically, we just pour over the information that we receive. We have like 100 activity logs. So information from the activity logs are actually uh, fed into the different uh, analytics tools that we have. We make use of word cloud. So the use of a word cloud allows us to visualize uh, frequently occurring words that we see across the activity logs. And these can help us to subject them to further analysis. And GIS tools uh, process uh, information uh, relating to date, time and place. The tools will be able to throw up any links between persons or common places. For instance, person A uh, was at, uh, at a place at a certain date and time. The tool will be able to flag up, for instance, person B, who was at the same place at around the same time. So we wanted to try and establish if there were any common places or any common persons that uh, you know they were linked to. So there was a need to look at the individual cases, but also to look at cases from this cluster as a whole. At the macro level, 
We zoom out from the individual case and we examine the links across the different cases in all of Singapore to help us identify sources of transmission and also how the transmission could have taken place. So the software will see through all the words in these logs and come up with like the top 10 or top 20 depending on the criteria. We zoom in down to the micro level, we took a look at the activity logs and see if there are any details that we could have uh, missed out. In the interviews, sometimes there is the lack of information pertaining to a patient's uh, activity or links. In some of the cases, uh, the patients were not in a condition to be interviewed. Uh, in others, uh, some patients could not remember the details or they gave uh, an incomplete uh, information. The most challenging aspect is the lack of information. Time is of the essence. There is active transmission happening and it's really the race against time. So there is an urgent need for us to identify uh, sources of infection. The interviews come in useful because the interviews help to jog uh, the memory and uh, provide the finer details which may have been overlooked in the first place. Basically, what we want to do is we want to narrow down to see if there is any uh, place, any shop for instance, that all these cases have been to and see if that could have been a potential uh, source of where the virus could have been transmitted. And so the interview team will be tasked to ask these questions to the patient. I was tasked by CID Command Centre to go down to NCID to interview a few patients that are awarded there. My name is DSP Tiu Ming Hui. I'm the Deputy Officer in Charge of a team at the Specialised Crime Branch Criminal Investigation Department. Being a contact tracer is a very similar job to my work as an Investigation Officer. The objective is to get the information out from that interview. It depends on how cooperative is the case person. We need to pose questions again and again to them and see where are the loopholes and to gather more facts so that it can have a more detailed activity logs. When I reached there with my colleague, we got to know that patient A and I were in the same ward because as long as they are uh, related, they can put inside the same isolation room. So patient A and I are actually a couple from Wuhan. We able to see them through the isolation room window. So we interview them via intercom telephone. We identify ourselves first that we are from the police and we would like to interview you for more details on the past 14 days. We know that we interviewed you before, but we do need more details. So we want to get more information where the hospital team may not have gotten the information earlier. We try to interview the husband first, but he seemed uninterested. Most of the patients will say that they have already given their, the information uh, to the contact tracer earlier. So they will ask a lot of questions, say, why you still need so much information? 
And the problem with that is that we will lose time um, in trying to contain the virus. So we really need individuals to cooperate with us because every minute that we um, spend in trying to get the information means a minute more that the virus could actually spread or propagate. We need to be patient and we try to build rapport with them. I got the wife to the phone. The whole conversation was in Mandarin. I told him that I hope you can cooperate with us so that we can help to stop the spread of the virus. So we just have to convince them that it's to protect the public. Then we say, okay, okay, what you want to know from there, then we will start it from the first day, from the day of his onset. For case eight and nine, they developed symptoms on the 24th of January and they were treated and warded in the hospital on 27th of January. Then we work back from there, what do you do on this particular date and from what time to what time. From there we go hour by hour. They arrived in Singapore on 19th January, so that was their first day in Singapore. After that, I said, okay, after you arrive in Singapore, where do you go? And they told us that, okay, they dropped their luggage at the place where they stay. And after that, took a bus to attend a Sunday church service. So I said, where is the church service? But because they are not familiar with Singapore, they couldn't tell me the church name. So I probed them with another question, said, can you tell me where is this church? The any address of the church? They also can't provide it to me. So I started giving them certain landmarks. It's the church nearby an MRT station, a bus stop. Is there an overhead bridge near the church? But they can't provide me with that information because they just arrived in Singapore on that particular day. Then they told me that actually they follow this pastor in social media. They were here just to attend that particular church service conducted by this pastor. So I asked them who is the pastor that conduct the church service. Their wife was able to tell me the pastor name in Mandarin. So immediately I told my colleagues who were standing beside me to do that internet search. We searched that Chinese name. The result came back with live church and mission. So immediately, we submitted this information back to our CID command center. Through investigations by the police, we actually found that the couple who arrived from Wuhan, China, on the 19th of January, had gone to church that morning immediately after arriving in Singapore and were likely the source of infection of that cluster. We think that two individuals may have gotten the disease through sort of droplet transmission. When there are activities such as a singing, loud talking, there's also greater propensity for droplets to be expelled. And the third individual interestingly, was not in church at the same time. The couple from China went to church that morning and sat at the seat during the service. And then the other case came into church and sat at the same seat. So we think that it is possible that the other case had got an infection from formite transmission it was very likely that they had spread the disease to the other three church members. But interestingly, the couple from China, in fact, they were not yet symptomatic. There were no symptoms such as fever or pneumonia.
In the early phases of the disease, there were a lot of uh, things we didn't know about how the disease transmits. This is a coronavirus that's very similar to the SARS coronavirus. In fact, the virus that causes COVID-19 is called SARS coronavirus 2. And we knew that in SARS, most individuals would only be most infectious after the onset of fever. And once we isolate these febrile individuals, we could actually stop the transmission of SARS, which is why we managed to control SARS in Singapore. But we realised that some individuals, even in the pre-symptomatic phase, could actually spread infection. We always try to stay one step ahead of the virus, but there's a lot of data coming out from Singapore and the rest of the world on COVID-19. However, not all of that data, firstly, is validated, and not all of the data is useful. So we have an entire team of individuals that are scouring all of the materials across the world for these pieces of information. And we have to then process information. So it is a very time-consuming, laborious and iterative process. Now, as more data came about, we found that the optimal time for contact tracing was actually two days before the onset of symptoms. And we quickly adjusted our contact tracing protocols to match the evidence that we find. Still, we were relieved because that meant that we had closed that case and that also ring-fenced them and prevent any onward spread. But we could not rest on our laurels. We now have a name for the disease, and it is COVID-19. As of 6 a.m. Geneva time this morning, tragically, we have now surpassed 1,000 deaths. Mid-February, we identified the first two cases from another church the Grace Assembly of God Church. It was a sense of deja vu. It just solved one cluster and there was another one. Subsequently, there were actually five more cases that was announced on the next day. The Grace Assembly of God Church will stop all its services for 14 days as the church has been identified as a COVID-19 cluster. There are seven Singaporeans linked to it, including its pastor. The church had quite a large congregation. So this was quite concerning for us because that was quite a large number and was the largest cluster to date. We knew that um, cases within a similar setting could potentially occur very quickly and uh, there was an urgent need to find out the source of infection to stop the spread. Grace Assembly of God Church is uh, not affiliated with the Life Church and Missions. Likewise, um, none of them had uh, recent travel um, to China. There was no um, source for the disease to have spread into the church. A few days later, we realised that there were more and more cases attributed to this church cluster. Grace Assembly of God is now the biggest cluster in Singapore. This just in, there have been more patients linked to the church, making it the largest cluster the in Singapore. Cluster, yeah. The biggest cluster. We've all heard that super spreading event. There are a big cluster of infections. Is there a mystery spreader out there still carrying the virus and still infecting people? Is there a super spreader in Singapore? There was concern in what many people would term as a super spreader event. The super spreading event is when you have one person, a very infectious person, that may have spread disease to many people. So we look through the activity maps of each of the other cases in the uh, Grace Assembly of God cluster. 
We thought Case 48 could have been the source of infection at the Grace Assembly of God cluster because he was the first confirmed case from this cluster. Case 48, who was the index case of the Grace Church cluster, was a staff at the church. We had to identify all close contact of case to prevent further disease transmission. Well, as a general rule, we use 2 meters and 30 minutes of interaction to label that individual as a close contact. So we look at his activity log, we look at the people he was in contact with. Based on Case 48 accounts provided to the Ministry of Health, Case 48 mentioned that he sat close to two different individuals in the cinema hall watching the movies. We are tasked to find two close contact persons to establish their identity. We got the images provided by the staff from the CCTV cameras that they viewed prior to our arrival. We are looking at two different individuals for a male individual and a female. The CCTV image is not that clear. As such, we need to base on their movement, their attires and their appearance to search for them. One of the individuals is wearing a flowery print dress. As such, it's easier for us to spot her in the CCTV cameras. After she left the cinema hall, she went window shopping from level to level. There are some uh, points that she went to the blind spot or the missing angles of the CCTV. When we lost track of her, we need to make some ground inquiries with the shops to try to establish where she went next. So eventually, we managed to locate her. After she leaves the mall, that is the one of the challenging part because in Orchard there's a lot of shopping malls, so she might visit other malls also. But for this case, for her, she head straight home. She took the train and head back to the HDB blocks that she stayed. In a HDB, we only have limited CCTV cameras. So we need to do our legwork to get her ID. We give the description of her and eventually the neighbour pointed to that particular unit. So the next day, then we're able to establish her identity. We were still trying to establish the source of infection for case 48. When we do a contact tracing, and this is a backward contact tracing to look for the source of infection, we always look for sort of a gatherings or activities where there's a lot of mixing, a lot of close interactions with people who could be potentially infected and infectious. Of course, that was the Chinese New Year period and a lot of people were out and about. And a lot of people coming together from different parts of the country 
and there's a lot of interactions. So we were concerned about whether any one of these gatherings could have resulted in disease transmission. So areas that we looked at was the routes he took to go to work, for instance, places that he went to, the people he interacted with. I spent a couple of days looking into case 48 and trying to establish uh, his source of infection. We were trying our best to dig up any information that we could get, but we couldn't tell for sure that he was the source of infection. Nothing was confirmed. In an outbreak, the identification of the cases never follows a nice time sequence of events. During the investigations, the first case that is identified or notified to us might not be the first case that had spread disease within that entire outbreak or cluster. We have to use many investigative tools to piece together what actually had happened. One of the qualities of an analyst would be, you know, having a positive mindset and being, you know, persistent, having the perseverance. So yeah, we had just had to do it because we knew from the Life Church cluster that this could potentially grow bigger. So we needed to uh, find out the source of infection fast. After working on case 48 for a couple of days, other cases within the cluster uh, emerged. We found even more cases linked to the Grace Assembly of God Church, either directly or through other staff members. It was important to find out his source of infection to slow down the spread. There was definitely pressure, you know, coming from everywhere. The public was anxious. We needed to find answers. Through investigations, we actually identified another positive case, in this case, case 66. Case 66, even though he was discovered later, through the interviews, we noted that his symptoms onset date was actually the earliest. In fact, it was the earliest among the cluster. Case 66 was also a staff at the church and therefore was in contact with many of the other church workers and employees. We found that he was symptomatic on 29th January and he went to work. So subsequently, there was also cases linked to the church. That was when we turned our attention to case 66 because we had this hypothesis, oh, could case 66 be the index case for the Grace Assembly of God Church cluster instead of case 48? And could he be the one that had infected the rest within the cluster? So this was potentially a lead that could bring us closer to finding out the source of uh, the infection at the Grace Assembly of God Church. We had to do a lot of investigation to find out where could he have gotten infection from because he did not have recent travel history to China, nor was he in contact with any other known COVID-19 case. So we have to investigate all of the social activities for K66. So when we investigated K66 movement history, uh, we realized that among many other activities that uh, he had participated in, he had uh, a Chinese New Year gathering on the 25th of January with family members uh, in May Huan Drive. This really uh, like, sparked an interest in us because, as with any gathering, large gatherings present the opportunity for transmission to occur. Chinese New Year is an occasion where Chinese people come together to celebrate the New Year. And it involves gathering of the extended family, so usually there are many people who will come together for a meal. That's the traditional lo he or the tossing of salad. There's a lot of sharing of stories with relatives who you may not have seen for a while throughout the year. So there's certainly very close interactions 
And this, of course, also provides a lot of opportunities for the spread of diseases like COVID-19. So we took a look at the gathering and we got the interview team to obtain the list of attendees at that gathering. We ran through this attendee list through our link analysis tools. Through the use of our link analysis tools, uh, we discovered a couple uh, who had attended the gathering. They were locals. This couple was from Singapore. And further investigation of these two individuals found that they had actually been part of the live church admissions, which set off alarm bells and red flags. So this really sort of arose our suspicions and we had to piece together this sequence of events. And that was when we zoomed in and investigated further into this couple. When we further probe, we found that they have actually also visited the live church and mission. The couple were in church on the 19th of January. Same day as the Wuhan travellers. Case 8 and 9, that was when the imported cases were at the church as well. And we came up with the hypothesis, oh, okay. So now we have case 66 from the Grace Assembly cluster. We have a gathering and we have a couple that was at both the gathering and at the live church. Could the virus been transmitted from the live church, which we already know it's a cluster, through an intermediary event that is the Chinese New Year gathering? On the 25th of January, a Chinese New Year gathering. And then this case then went on to spread disease to that Great Assembly cluster. But of course, this is only based on conjectural evidence because this was some time ago and we did not have concrete evidence that these two individuals, a couple from Singapore who were at the live church and at the gathering, were in fact infected with COVID-19. But this was extremely important for us to prove because this meant that there was not an unknown chain of transmission out there in the rest of the Singapore community. We conveyed these findings to the interview team and got them to interview the couple from Singapore. When we interviewed the couple from Singapore, they were well. But it was subsequently revealed that the couple was unwell after the gathering. During the interview, we uncovered that they in fact had symptoms compatible with COVID-19. That was during the end of January and they have sought medical attention then. So we looked at the symptom onset dates and we thought that, okay, this is possible. The couple from Singapore could have been infectious during the gathering and thereafter recovered subsequently. One had symptoms after the gathering, while the other was actually symptomatic during the family gathering and was likely the one that had spread the disease to the Grace Assembly case. But they had not been identified as COVID-19 cases. We had to go back in time to establish if they had been infected with COVID-19 and therefore prove the link between the two church clusters and the family gathering. We sent them for the routine PCR test 
which is sort of a gold standard laboratory test which we use for COVID-19. And this detects essentially genetic material that's present in the individual who is infected with COVID-19. When the person is in the infectious phase of the disease, when we tested the both of them, the individual who had symptoms earlier, the one with the earlier onset of symptoms and likely had spread disease during the 25th of January gathering was actually negative on PCR. Only one of them was positive on PCR, but was not the likely mode of spread. And so we did not find any conclusive um, evidence. We thought that this couple these two individuals could already had recovered from their illness. How do we prove that someone was previously infected with COVID-19 and had spread to the rest of the cluster? So this is where the serology test comes in. But at that time, it did not exist for COVID-19 virus. I'm Wang Lingfao. I'm currently a professor and the director of the Emerging Infectious Disease Program at Duke and Yes. I have been working with uh, zoonotic virus from animal to human for the last 25 years. They came to me to say, we have somebody that highly suspected now is actually brought the virus from one class to the other. But because it's already a month later, usually it's too late to do the molecular test. The PCR test zoom into the genetic material of the virus. So it only works when you still have the virus in your body. But our body fights really hard, our immune system, and one of the immune system is antibody. As soon as our immune system wins, the virus is cleared out. Usually that takes days to weeks, two weeks. And usually months later, you already recover, the virus is gone. But the antibodies, the molecule which fights you know, the virus in your blood will remain for months and years. You know. Serology test essentially detects for the presence of antibodies to a certain disease. Serology tests have been used to identify um, sort of past infection in other diseases. But for COVID-19, this was unprecedented. Usually, if you want to commercialize a serologic test or antibody test, it takes years. But he had in fact been working on a new serology test for COVID-19. So we were the first group in the whole world develop a specific test for this novel coronavirus. We achieved that in two months. So that is like a lightning speed. I call it COVID-19 speed. So when we knew that we had to identify a past infection in these two individuals, I picked up the phone and rang Professor Wang to ask him if he could deploy this new test he had. So Dr. Lee, first he asked me, am I ready? is your team ready? And I said, I'm ready. And they actually asked, how confident you are? I said, I'm 99.99% confident. And they said, all right, let's do it. He was very confident that he had a serology test that was robust and that could identify a recovered COVID-19 individual. And then he said, great, we will send a sample to your lab. We will send a total of four samples, but we did not know whether all four are from the same individual or four different individuals. In a research or diagnostic lab, usually people send a sample blinded so that you're not biased. So we did blindly. And within three days, we had a data. Professor Wang called me and said, I'm 99.9% .9 confident that person had virus infection. When I sent back this to Vernon, he could not believe it because that's the person is the suspect. There was no doubt in our mind that that was the missing link that joined the two church clusters. We confirmed the link was that from cases 8 and 9, they have passed the infection on to cases 83 and 91. And they could have passed the infection to case 66 in the family gathering. 
and this K66 could have passed on the infection to his colleagues in Grace Assembly of God. Likely a world first, the serological test developed by Duke NUS Medical School uses blood samples that can detect coronavirus infections in patients who have recovered from the disease. Singapore is the first country to use serology to do contact tracing. So as a scientist, you know, that's as good as you can get. I think contact tracing really marries, you know, um, science, um, investigational tools, and also a lot of communication skills all into one. It is a bit like a private eye because you really have to think about how things had happened, go and investigate it using the scientific basis for how diseases spread. Our contact tracing and our ring fencing had actually prevented onward transmission in Singapore. And we could at least say that that closed that chapter of these clusters. I think we were just glad that it's over. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, uh, because other cases were happening. So it is not a time to drop the ball on, you know, the other cases. So for us, it was, yes, we were happy at that point, but it was time to move on to the other cases. We're watching the situation very carefully monitoring the developments. We are quite prepared to adjust our posture and our stance as and when we see the development happening around us. March was when things started to change. Singapore's coronavirus numbers have skyrocketed, propelled by a surge in infections among its migrant worker population. We were not able to keep a lid on it because the virus was obviously outrunning, outgunning the contact tracing team we realised that we had to take a different tack. 